John chapter 3, verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher from God. No man can do these miracles except that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. And so is everyone that is born of the spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, can these How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and we testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I'd have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No man hath ascended up to heaven, But he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Well, may the Lord bless the truth to our hearts tonight, the reading of his precious word. Well, I wonder if you can guess the text that I'm going to take tonight from our reading. Beautiful reading, of course. It's a very well-known passage. And it's our Lord Jesus speaking to that religious leader, Nicodemus. And I'm going to take that text even the very words of our Lord Jesus tonight. It's John 3.16, very well known. You could probably recite it without reading it from the Bible because it's known so well, isn't it? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's hard to think, isn't it, back just a fortnight ago, it was uh, Christmas Eve, and all that's happened since then, I trust that we've had a good time uh, with uh, perhaps family and friends, and even now into this new year, perhaps not been the first Sunday of the new year, not too late to wish you one and all uh, a happy new year, and trust that the Lord might lead us through this. I think we've been praying in, in that way tonight anyway. But what we've been... Uh, thinking about perhaps over this season is that of um, abundance. Perhaps we've bought um, uh, food and so forth that we don't normally buy at this time. <laughs> but we do, we buy it, don't we? It is, uh, 
And particularly, I don't know whether you've noticed that this time of the year, in the run-up to Christmas especially, there is this aspect of uh, uh, different food being presented before us, perhaps repackaged or uh, made a little bit more luxurious, more expensive, of course. But I'm thinking particularly tonight of nuts. You know, they come in those bags, don't they? And uh, there they are. And you lift them up and they chinkle, don't they? Different types of nuts. You know, you get walnuts, don't you? And Brazil nuts and, um, uh, well, um, all sorts of nuts there. Hazelnuts. I'm sure you can think of other nuts as well. Not everybody likes nuts, do they? Do you like nuts? Well, a nut consists, of course, of two components. There's the shell and there's the kernel. Now, the shell of a nut is hard and brittle, and it's a protective outer skin, and it normally, of course, needs a nut cracker, doesn't it? And this is what happens at Christmas. We bring out the nut cracker, if we know, from the back of the drawer or back of the cupboard, and uh, we enjoy those nuts. The nut itself, the attributes, of course, you've got the kernel there, and it's uh, normally, again, I'm, I'm quoting from what I read on the internet about nuts, a softer, usually edible part of a nut, seed, or fruit stone contained within its shell. So you've got the shell, the outer, and then inside, you've got the kernel or the nut. And of course, it's easy, isn't it, this time of the year, to overindulge in the fancies and the sweetmeats are you allergic to nuts? Well, I'm going to send you a warning that this message contains nut. I trust that you don't have an allergy because I want to lead you through a healthy diet of spiritual food by considering basic and foundational nutrition as found in the gospel in a nutshell. The gospel in a nutshell. I don't know the origin of that well-known expression, the gospel in a nutshell, but I suspect it's to do with the sort of conciseness and the sort of compression, if you like, of this compound plan of God, the redemptive right of the Almighty, reduced to a readable resume of gospel goodness. It is the go-to evangelistic verse of many a preacher. It is the vital verse of the penitent sinner who clings to its truth and veracity as being the only hope in the face of certain and everlasting damnation, as being a brand plucked from the burning. So let's crack open this nut so that we're asking the Lord to help us to find eternal nourishment for our soul as we linger over the flavour and the goodness of the Lord himself. And I make no apology to sort of looking at this as being food, because in Psalm 34, verse 8, it says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. So, as you crack open your Bible to John chapter 3, in verse 16, we read that text again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In order to aid digestion of this spiritual delight, let's cut up the verse into five portions, adding some seasonal nativity flavouring, of course, and aromatic references to help us to bring out the truth of God's word. The first portion is, God so loved the world. God so loved the world. Did you receive any Christmas presents this year? <laughs> And uh, these, by and large, are a communication of family and friends' love and affection um, to you. And they say, by and large, 
because there are local traders and business people who send out their greetings at this time of the year. But indeed, uh, the, the cards and the gifts that we receive are mostly personal, with personal greetings, aren't they? Even from people we don't see from one year to the next. They remember us. They remember the good times in years gone by or appreciate our kindness to another member of the family or mutual friend. There are many reasons which motivate people to communicate with us and send greetings to at this time of the year. God's motivation for intervention and communication is his love. And the object of his love is the world. And we have it here in our first portion. For God so loved the world. The first letter of John chapter 4 verse 7 says this and other verses following. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God. For God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. In other words, we, we, John is, is writing here about the way in which God took the initiative, as it were, and he extended his love towards mankind. I think about that lovely hymn, God loved the world of sinners lost and ruined by the fall. In fact, we, God willing, we're going to sing this at, 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 at the end of our time together. Salvation full at highest cost, he offers free to all. Oh, it was love, it was wondrous love. The love of God to me brought my saviour from above to die on Calvary. Did you notice the fervent desire God has to impart his love? It is disclosed in that little word, so, which packs the punch, so to speak, and turbocharges with enthusiasm the love God has for the world. Here is more than a note of determination God has to reconcile a lost world back to himself. For God so loved the world. You are part of the world, God's creation, and God so loves you and me that we are in line for and the beneficiaries of God's love. And so we come on to our second portion, that he gave his only begotten son. At this time of the year, we think about gifts, giving and receiving. It's funny that when we're young, our preoccupation is, what am I going to get? Whilst when we're older, it is... What can I give? We hope that what we do give will be appreciated. Do you appreciate or do I appreciate God's gift to me? Yes, I do. Do you? A gift costs the giver so that the beneficiary, the recipient of the gift, pays nothing. Here is the ultimate expression of love. The father sacrificially gave his son into this sin sick world so that his son Jesus could sacrificially give his life, shed his blood on Calvary's cross. Why do I say the father sacrificially gave his son? The father, I believe, broke fellowship with Jesus whilst the sin laden Jesus was on the cross. This heart-rending cry is recorded in Matthew 27, verse 46. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sakhbaktani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? There's the sacrifice of the Father out of fellowship and the sacrifice of the Son he's making on the cross at Calvary. Asunder, if you like. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So, in effect, we're receiving a double gift. From God the Father, he gave his only begotten son. 
And this enabled the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, to give his life in dying for the sin of mankind. A present normally comes gift wrapped or in a bag with a tag. Jesus was no exception. I don't know how many babies were born in Bethlehem that time, but Jesus, he, was identifiable to the shepherds. And, of course, we get that in Luke's Gospel, chapter 2. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, which is Christ the Lord, and this shall be the sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. What a gift. Gift wrapped. Hallelujah. So may we say with the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 9 verse 15. Thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. Praise him. Our third portion now is that whosoever believeth in him. That whosoever believeth in him. Here we come to a filter. The situation is this. A gift is freely given... That's the definition of a gift. It can't be earned, bought, deserved, or won. No, the gift is God's expression of love given by him to the world. And here's where the filter comes in. Not everybody receives the gift. From one W to another. From world to whosoever. Given to the world, received by the whosoever. So God gives to the world, but only the whosoever believeth in him receives the gift. The whosoever is the believer in Jesus. Belief in Jesus is not like believing in Father Christmas. No, belief in Jesus is vital in receiving him who alone bestows exclusive benefit of everlasting life. And belief in him is having solid Cast thine faith in Jesus. If you had a, a sum of money, for instance, and uh, you, you were going to invest it, and you were sort of scratching your head, what, who, where shall I invest this? This looks a good, uh, uh, safe investment here. But uh, I won't invest it all just in case it goes under, and I'll put some other in somewhere else. In fact, uh, you're not actually... Um, exercising your faith in that particular financial institution, are you? If you've got, got misgivings. No, belief in Jesus is life-changing. He sustained life-changing injuries on the cross, even death, so that we could die to sin and self and be made alive to Christ. Go through that mandatory procedure for all Christians... And that's to be followers of Christ, being born again, as Jesus spoke to Nicodemus, and have that life-changing experience. Peter puts it this way in 1 Peter 2 verse 24. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness. One who exercised faith was John the Baptist, John 1, 29. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Not everyone believeth or will believe in Jesus. Uh, again, John uh, writes this, doesn't he, in 1 John 11. He came unto his own. And his own received him not. Some rejected and will reject Jesus. It seems hard to say that, but it happens to Christmas presents. <laughs> and we, we see this, don't we, uh, on eBay or in the classifieds. Reason for sale, unwanted gift. But hallelujah, we carry on to the next verse. Verse 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So before we move on to the next portion then, are you one of the whosoevers 
who believeth in him. So our next portion should not perish, should not perish. I believe that Jesus spoke more than anybody about hell and hell fire. Matthew 23, 33. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Matthew 5, 22. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. Jesus described what hell is like when he spoke to the rich man, sorry, about the rich man who had died. That's in Luke 16, 23. And in hell, this is the rich man, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus, that's the beggar, in his bosom. Hell is perpetual and conscious torment. Clearly, hell is to be avoided at all costs. And this is the very reason Jesus came into the world to take the punishment for our sin and save us from the eternal fire and torment. It's interesting that Jesus tells us that hell itself is prepared for the devil and his angels. It wasn't prepared for mankind. It's prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25, 41. Then shall you say unto them, he shall say unto them on his left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And hell along with death is destined for the lake of fire. We read that in Revelation 20, 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. What dreadful future awaits the unbeliever. Going back to John 3 now, verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is where salvation comes into our text. There is a hell to be shunned and a heaven to be gained. God knows how terrible and horrendous hell is. He wants us to save us from it and from its clutches. And the only way to do that was to send his son Jesus into this sinful world and deal with sin once and for all. Salvation is effected only through Jesus. And it's effective only for those the whosoever who accept and believe that Jesus died for them. The gift must be personally received and acknowledged by the humble, penitent recipient. 2 Peter 3 verse 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us with not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Whosoever will may come. Salvation is open and available to all who believe. So by considering this text as a feast, we've come to the only negative part. Shall, should not perish, which we are to reject metaphorically, leave on the side of the plate, in favour of enjoying the final portion now, which is portion number five. But have everlasting life. Just as we are unable to fully comprehend what hell is like, so it's hard to fully take in what heaven is like. We know that God will be doing away with the old and making all things new. Revelation 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God, out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Although the New Jerusalem is as a bride adorned, when we accept the gift, Jesus, we are entering into a relationship with him. The Bible describes us as becoming the bride of Christ. When Carol and I married, we gave ourselves to each other. We both said, I will. 
We both acknowledged our belief and faith in each other till death us do part. Our union with Christ is more in the storybook tradition of living happily ever after, forever with the Lord. Hallelujah. So we've been enjoying uh, spiritual food by digesting the gospel in a nutshell. Its wholesomeness is found in that God gave the gift, even Jesus, who in turn gives life eternal. Notice that the gift is the person, Jesus, whose name means salvation. He is our bridegroom with whom we will live eternally. Much as we look forward to living with Jesus in the presence of the Father and the Holy Spirit forever, we must never forget that the gift we receive is Jesus. A verse of that lovely hymn comes to mind, the sands of time are sinking. And it puts it this way, the bride eyes not her garment, but her dear bridegroom's face. I will not gaze at glory, but on my king of grace. Not at the crown he giveth, but on his pierced hands. The lamb is all the glory of Emmanuel's land. Let me close by referring to a round robin that we had in a recent Christmas card. Our friend who does public speaking described the busy year that she'd had and how she's hoping to relax during this coming year. She ended her missive. The title for my speaking presentations is Now I Belong to Me. Brackets, not to a cult. Close bracket. I'm not quite sure what she means by the latest or the last part of that phrase, not to a cult, but the, that, that's known to her. I want to really um, be prompted by what, uh, how she closed, now I belong to me, by thinking about our Lord Jesus. May we rejoice with the hymn writer in the reality of the gift, even Jesus. Jesus, my Lord, will love me forever. From him no power of evil can sever. He gave his life a ran to ransom my soul. Now I belong to him. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me, not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. May the Lord bless those few thoughts upon that a feast that we've been enjoying tonight. And may the Lord speak to us, if we're not his, that we might become his. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Yes, repentance from sin is involved in that. We want to please our bridegroom, won't we? Hallelujah. May the Lord bless these thoughts.